Will you stand with me? We get to do a very joyous thing, reading God's Word. Uh, hopefully, you're reading God's Word regularly and consistently. Um, if you're not, I would encourage you not to make big, huge spiritual decisions because we are, we're making them apart from Christ. Um, I had someone walk up to me this morning and say, I read the Bible this week, and what a joy it is to see young people excited to read the Word of God. Encourage it. Drive them to it. Show them how. Parents and grandparents, when, you're, when you're, your family members visit your house as a grandparent, it's not just time to give them candy. You can do that too, but also read the Word of God with them. Show them that you are as, as fixed on the Word of God as their parents are. It's a generational thing. And if we are not in the Word as a people, nobody else will be either. And if we're not in the Word, they're not in the Word, Christ will eventually fade from the minds of people. So let's be in the Word. Jeremiah chapter 24. Here now, the reading of God's Word. We're going to cover 24 and 25 this week, uh, but we're going to read chapter 24, verses 1 to 10. After Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken into exile from Jerusalem, Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, together with the officials of Judah, the craftsmen and the metal workers, and he had brought them to Babylon, the Lord showed me this vision. Behold, two baskets of figs placed before the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like the first ripe figs, but the other basket had very bad figs, so bad that they could not be eaten. And the, and the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs. The good figs, very good. And the bad figs, very bad, so that they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. But, thus says the Lord, like the bad figs that are so bad that they cannot be eaten, so will I treat Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land and to those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine, pestilence upon them until they shall be utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their fathers. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Sincerely and truthfully, we, we give you thanks because without it, we would not know of Christ. We would not be fixed upon him. We would not understand our need. And so, Lord, today, reveal our need more deeply and richly to us and present Christ to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. If you ordered one of these guys, they're in the back, grab it. If you haven't paid for it, pay for it. Uh, if you... Um, just put the money in the offering plate or Venmo it, give it to Grace, whatever. I told Ryan and Sam they didn't have to worry about money. They could just buy them. Um, if you want to defraud the church and not pay for it, I'm kidding. Uh, if you can't afford one and you really want one, uh, let us know. We can get you one. Um, but study notes, uh, the, the sheets each week go in there. Place for prayer uh, requests. And we can use these Sunday evenings and Sunday mornings. Uh, the next thing they're going to do is pre present a, get a laminated sheet that everybody can put in here with their names. 
so that you know whose is whose. And you can then even leave them at the church if you would like to or take them home for the prayer request each week. But uh, from just wanted to use these as a way. Um, we were joking uh, and uh, earlier said, this is not something that you get to heaven and go, look, God, I had all my sermon notes. Uh, this does not make you holier. Um, and you might actually get there and he goes, well, page 36 has an error on it. So don't listen to that. Um, but not a sales pitch. We're not making any money off of it. Just wanted you to know that they're available and uh, put, present that out there. Sometimes I wonder if I'd make a good salesman. I don't know. We've only sold like 10, so I don't think so. No, I'm kidding. I don't know how many there were. Um, let's turn now to the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we are back in Jeremiah today, chapter 24 and 25. And what we will see today is that the gospel is both foolish and powerful. I think you know this from Scripture, if you know the Word of God. Uh, it's called both things in various aspects to different people. And today, uh, these verses, these chapters, this section of the letter uh, or the prophecy that Jeremiah put together, um, it builds off of chapter 21. You know, we, we talked about a vision that he just saw. He had this vision of two figs and 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 the good and the bad figs. And, and that comes what we're going to see is he's building off of what God had told him or shown him back in Jeremiah chapter 21, where he said this, Behold, I set before you today the way of life and the way of death. He who stays in the city shall die. But, he goes on later, he that surrenders to the Chaldeans shall live. Um, I took out sections of the verse to fit it on the screen, but you can go back and read it. Um, that's two verses. But God presents to them... <coughs> If, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, as we've been going through it, you're like, man, I see why Jeremiah is a weeping prophet. God had just laid on him constantly this message of you're going to die. You're going to be carried away. Just think about how how um, how difficult it can become when you watch the what we would call them talking heads on TV that constantly tell you that America is in a downfall. It may be true, but man, to hear about it constantly and to have somebody telling you it's from the word of God, weeping, miserable life, uh, if you're not covered in, in God Almighty and in Christ today. So he tells them, if you resist, it's, it's the idea of resist versus surrender. What, what are you going to do? What are the, the two options? And that's where the vision of these two baskets of figs to come in in chapter 24 to fill in the rest of the story fill in the rest of this picture. Um, the Lord showed me a vision. Behold, two baskets of figs placed before the temple. Uh, when I first read this, my mind immediately went to placed before God's presence, placed in judgment between the two good and bad, right? That's, that's what God, we talked about God's nature, God's economy, as we talked about earlier. It's been kind of the story of Jeremiah. God has two things, two options. You're good and you get to heaven. You're bad and you go to hell. And everybody goes, but that's not the gospel. That absolutely is the gospel. It's the beginnings of the gospel. It's not the full gospel, but that is the beginnings of the gospel because we know the gospel says to get good enough to go to heaven, you must be clothed with Christ, covered by Christ, in Christ, washed clean by the blood of Christ. It never says you yourself go do good things to get to heaven. He says, you can't. It actually says you're both bad. But God separates some out and calls them good, views them, accounts them as good. So I read that, and then um, I read a commentator that said, well, these are like the first fruits that come as offerings to God. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I've misunderstood this. Then I found another commentator that agreed with me, so I'm going with this one. No, no. Um, the second commentator that I did go is the one that I really trust. Uh, and he's been, I, I agree with where he speaks. And he says, here's why that one view is not the correct view. And I went, that's where my mind was. You feel really good when you've got somebody that you trust and you agree with them uh, ahead of time before you read their words. And so that's what God is placing before Jeremiah. This picture of judging the good versus evil, moral versus immoral, uh, Good behavior versus wicked behavior, holy versus unholy. And he says, um, the good figs 
why, why would he use figs? Because we're like, I don't really, I'm not sure I'm a fig eater. Uh, but he, this was a plant, a, a fruit that they would be um, uh, fa- wanting to eat back then. Uh, and I'm sure somebody's going to come up to me and tell me that the fig is actually a vegetable. I have no idea. I'm assuming it's a fruit, but I'm always wrong on these things. So for, I didn't actually research that. Um, but the good figs says that they are they are favored by the eaters. Like he says, you can't eat the bad ones, but you can eat the good ones. So there's this picture of I want these, but I want to not have these. Um, think about the good fig for a minute. What made them good? They fulfilled their purpose. A fig is designed to grow and be ripe and be eaten. But if it's not eaten, it kind of falls to the ground. And, and we know the whole story it can become probably probably has seeds in it, plants other fig trees. But let's go with this vision for a minute. They're good because the, the eater wants them. They desires them. They, they're fulfilling their purpose. And he says to Jeremiah, let me explain this vision to you because Jeremiah's going, baskets of figs, temple. What do you want me to do with this, God? God says, well, let me tell you. He says, um, the exiles, the ones whom I removed from Jerusalem and Judah, they're like the good figs. They are regarded as good they're rewarded in verse six he goes on to tell us that they will be rewarded as though they had been morally good people if i were jeremiah at this point i'm going did i just have to go tell everybody that nobody's good and they're terrible people and what are you what's going on here but he says they will be restored from captivity eventually They will be restored to their original design. He says, I'm going to give them a new heart. They're going to have fellowship with me. They're going to be my beloved people. How's that going to happen? I will give them a new heart, a heart that knows that I am the Lord. He says, they're not going to just give me some semblance of, oh yeah, I love Jesus and I love Baal also. Uh, They're not going to, let me come to the temple on early on the Sabbath and then go back and live worldliness the rest of the day and the week. They're not going to just act the act to appease a deity. They're actually going to return to me with their whole hearts. Those are the good figs. Now, the other people that stay in Jerusalem, they're going to be like the bad figs. What do you do with those bad figs? Well, you don't keep them around the house. You throw them out in trash. And we go, oh, yeah, throw them in the trash. Have you seen pictures of Paris where they're uh, recently where their trash pickup is as they, they're, they're um, protesting? And they have certain parts of the city where pi- trash is just piling up. Like you see people walking on the sidewalks in the middle of the street. Trash is piled this high. It's just trash everywhere. And um that's probably more of the vision that he's given here is they're just filthy, disgusting. They're not edible. Get rid of them. We, we want to not have them around at all because we don't just toss trash out. We take it out and we remove it far from us because it attracts other disgusting things. They're talking about, I saw some reports of if this is a place for rats to come, right? When it's attracting um, dangerous things. He said, that's the, those are the ones that will be left behind in Jerusalem. They will be rewarded for their immoral deeds. And they will be a curse in all places. They will bring trouble to whatever places they go to. And God will ultimately cleanse the land of their presence. That's how God's going to treat the people that stayed and the people that left. Going back to Jeremiah 21, if you surrender, I will preserve you and you will have life. If you stay and resist, you're resisting my will. You will be treated as immoral and unclean, and you will be a curse not only to yourself, but to whatever land I bring you to. You yourself will be a curse. Um. Surrendering surrendering to the Chaldeans was eventually equivalent to surrendering to God in faith because it makes no sense as an American to one day walk out and go, I'm going to surrender to 
put your country there, China, uh, Russia, maybe even Venezuela. We have no idea what the Lord's going to do. Who rises up in power? It makes no sense for us to surrender because we have this national pride to go down fighting. And he says, do not go down fighting. This is not a battle you will win. Do you trust me and my message delivered through Jeremiah to turn back, to surrender yourself? Surrendering is foolish unless the enemy is infinitely gracious and merciful. You go, well, they weren't merciful and gracious. They weren't the enemy. What has Jeremiah been telling them the whole time? I am bringing these people to you. I am your enemy. The word of the cross, Paul tells us, it's foolish to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The word of the cross is foolish. Not just a, yeah, you take it or leave it. No, they, they be, those who have embraced and, and really grabbed hold of their unbelief, they're looking at us going, you're nothing but a bunch of fools. And we go, yeah, but this is salvation. That's the distinction that's going on here. Okay, so how did God distinguish? What makes good figs good? Well, from man's experience, what did they do? They stood up. Maybe they packed a bag of clothes. I don't really know. He didn't tell us. Did they walk out of the gates? Were there gates around? Were they in Jerusalem? Were they in the lands around Jerusalem? They left their city. Did they persuade people to come with them? Whatever they did, they believed and trusted Jeremiah foolishly to the society around them and walked out into the hands of the enemy and said, I surrender. I surrender all is the song we sing. Surrendering to the enemy, our enemy, the one that we hate, the one that we can't trust to at all. They walked out in obedience to God, trusting by experience, by surrendering. I stood up. I walked out. It was my will, my purpose, my desire to get out away from this and into whatever this is coming because I trusted God. That was man's experience. It was the real experience, and it's exactly what happened, and it was the, the, their heart and their desire to do that. Now, here's God's explanation. He didn't say, oh, they did a good thing. Because of their good deed, I accepted them. He says, no, I will regard them as good. The, the, the Hebrew there, as you dig into it, it's this, it's this um, a call. It's a causal word. And he's saying, "I will, I will be the one that is that is causing them to, to to have goodness because I'm going to treat them as though they are like the good figs. I'm going to treat them differently than the actual bad figs that they are. That's what he. That's what the words of Jeremiah. And what we learn from that is." One right action didn't clean their record. They weren't these evil people that Jeremiah was talking about. And all of a sudden, they stood up and went, I'm done with this. I'm walking out. And God goes, finally, you're good enough for me to accept you. That's not what he did. He said, I will regard you as good. One right action does not clean the record. Just as clearing a browser history doesn't wipe away the search history from the servers. We know that the history we have with God is always and forever there. They did not know God, he tells us. They were unregenerate. How do we know that? Because he says, when I call them out, I'm going to give them a new heart so they will know me. So these weren't regenerate people that were doing good things and earned favor before God. They found favor before God, just like Noah found favor before God, even though it was undeserved. God's word um, reveals that man cares for the field and the fig tree. We go plant the field. We go take care of the fig tree. But God's the one that produces the fruit. Who brings the rain? Who, who causes that fig tree to grow? Who really tends to the soil and makes sure that it's good? We can do what we can, but there are a number of things. Locusts can come. Animals can come. Uh, uh, my parents have 
um, they, they have tomatoes, I think, in their backyard, and the deer keep coming off the mountain and eating them. Or not mountain, a little tiny hill. It was a mountain when I was a kid. Um, but, like, you can't make things grow. We can't produce the fruits is what God's... This is God's explanation of what's happening behind the scenes in these people's lives. Man cares for the field, he cares for the fig tree, but God grows the fig. It seems unfair on the surface to distinguish between the surrenderers and the resistors. Both were disobedient. God said that all of Judah deserved disaster. So we talk about this in our confession of faith, um, one of, a part of our constitution as a church. And in chapter 3, section 5, he says, Before the foundation of the world was laid, God chose in Christ those of mankind who are predestined to life for everlasting glory, according to his eternal and immutable purpose, purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will. He did this out of his mere free grace and love. And a pause here. So anybody that's hearing this, it goes, that doesn't sound like the Westminster Confession. This is the modern English version. I took it to make it a little bit easier to read and to hear. He did all of this, though, out of his mere free grace and his love without any foreseeing of their faith, their good works, their perseverance in either of these or any other thing in the creature that might act as conditions or causes moving him to it. All of this is the pray is to the praise of his glorious grace. So we shouldn't fall back in despair because God did something that seems unfair. He distinguished between the good figs and the bad figs when they were all actually bad. Westminster leaning on scripture and, and gleaning and pulling out of scripture says, this is God's holy will and desire. He, 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 he didn't see anything in the creature, but he chose some. It's his right to save and, prov- and produce grace and mercy upon whomever he wills. And the great miracle of all of this, when he says the words in Christ, is that God was is able to reward us rotten figs. That's a miraculous thing. It's not something that could have been fixed within creation. God had to come down into creation. A miraculous birth where the Son of God took on flesh, the second person of the, tr- person of the Trinity took flesh upon himself. And he did it in a miraculous way that he was not impacted by the uh, transmittal of sin that happens from generation to generation, that, that dead uh, nature, sin nature we call it, where you are dead in your trespasses and sins as it's passed down from generation to generation, from parents to children, by, by the natural ways of generation. He bypassed all of that by having being born of a virgin. And, and what a miraculous thing that he could reward Rotten, disgusting figs with life and the joy of of living for what we were created to live for, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. The last place participants have been awarded medals. It's very fitting because we were at a race yesterday. And you see all the medals around you and you start going, I mean, I'm sitting here in jeans and, I was, and all these people are in shorts running. I'm going, well, I don't belong here. Then they start handing out medals and I'm like, I really want one of those, but I didn't do anything to earn that. I mean, they were really cool, except they said Tuscaloosa on them, had an elephant, so it kind of wasn't, wasn't the greatest medal. <clears throat> but small instances like that make you realize what we actually have. We're not leading the pack as Christians going, we're holy, 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 come with us. We're in the back going, oh, God, save us. Everybody, we're drowning. He's the only one that can help us. Come, come, gather, be in Christ. We're in last place. What does he say? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. He starts to kind of paint this picture before us. Okay, great. That was Jeremiah. That was Judah. Why is he? Why is? Why, what are you talking about? Why is that with us? Well, 
he goes on to explain that while he's going to bring these over and he'll bring them back to the land, the rest of Jeremiah starts to paint this picture of what's going to happen in the land while they're gone for 70 years. He actually says in 20, chapter 25, I think is where he gets into this, that they're going to be gone for 70 years. Um, he says, well, what's going to happen in that time? He's going to purge everything. Well, he's going to purge their land, but it's a picture to us that he's going to purge everything. Because he goes in, he, the, the second half of Jeremiah especially, starts talking about, I'm going to get them, I'm going to get them, I'm going to cleanse them, I'm going to punish them, I'm going to punish them. He goes way beyond Judah and Israel to all the earth. I will send for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I'm going to bring him bring Babylon against this land and its inhabitants. So first, I'm going to strike against Judah like I told you I would. I took Assyria, came and took the northern kingdom. Now Nebuchadnezzar is going to take the southern kingdom, and I will devote them to destruction. I'm going to purge the land of the wickedness before I bring these back and plant a new heart in them, and the land will now be filled with those who love me. Huh. Sounds like the gospel. Sounds like the Garden of Eden. Get out for your own protection. Now he spends the rest of Scripture telling us how he's going to put us back into his place that he created for us. Then, after 70 years, yeah, I knew it was in here. Um, after those are completed, I'm going to punish. Who's he going to punish? The king of Babylon. And everybody cheers. And that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, because you're going, as a, as a Jew, you're going, how look, they're worse than us. And God says, they're my servants right now. You're my enemy, not them. And I'm going to use them to do what I need to do. Um, all of this confirms that the people are morally indistinguishable. All the world, morally indistinguishable. And that God used Babylon to cleanse the land, agents of his wrath on Judah, and they were going to be in captivity for 70 years. And then he says, in beginning in verse 13, he begins to describe that all the nations will receive this cup of the wine of wrath. He says, come, Jeremiah, take this cup from my hand. You know, Jeremiah's going, oh, my goodness, not again. Like he's, he just constantly gets this message of destruction, this message. He says, take this, now go to everywhere and just tell them they're all going to drink from this cup. I'm not going to let anybody be free to continue to rebel against me. You want evidence of that? Look at the flood, the great flood. He wiped the earth clean. He will not allow destruction of his, of his, of his creation to continue. We go back to the Tower of Babel. They were trying to reach the gods. They had come and unified all as one people against the ways of God. And he said, you shall scatter. We don't know what that looked like, how all that worked. But what Scripture is trying to tell us over and over and over again is we will not, as a people, unite and rebel against God and be victorious. Satan tried it. Now Satan's trying to trick us into it. He is the father of lies. He's deceitful. He's, he knows the truth. He knows exactly who God is. And he trembles. And he's drowning. And while Christians are going, we're drowning, reach to the one who can save you. Satan's underneath grabbing their feet, yanking down as many as he can. I'm drowning, you'll drown too. And God says, I'm going to cleanse my earth. Those pierced by the Lord on that day shall extend well, hang on. First of all, he says the Lord has an indictment against the nations. Let me read that. Um, he's going to enter into judgment against all flesh. So Jeremiah says, this is not just about my time. This is a picture of what's coming. This is what will happen. And those that were pierced by the Lord on that day shall extend from one end of the earth to the other. They shall not be lamented. They shall not be gathered or buried. They shall be dung on the surface of the ground. God plans to cleanse all the earth as he cleansed the land of Israel. No flesh will escape. He is like a lion 
that has left his lair. When he's in the lair, he's calm and peaceful. He can, you know, you always have a picture of these cartoons with the Bugs Bunny, all that. They would sneak by, trying to wake up whatever enemy they had. And he'd come out, he'd, ah, ah, and I can't remember the exact scenario, but I always feel like they were always trying to sneak around and hide from somebody. And God's going to lay, lay low, lay silent for a while. But Jeremiah says, he's come out of his lair, y'all. He's coming for us. The end had begun. And Christ ushered in a new era. Jeremiah extends his prophetic word to us in these words. Will we trust God and surrender to our enemy? I surrender all. Lord, forgive me. In hope of being exalted out of the muck and mire and restored to what we were created to be. But first, you got to answer that question. Who actually is our enemy? The answer is the Lord. Jeremiah is delivering the cup, God's cup of wrath. Take this cup from my hand. And I'm going to make all nations drink from it. All the ones that I send to you. You see, it made more sense because at the beginning of this, we talked about Jeconiah, I believe it was the son of Jehoiakim. He was the one carried off. Well, you know who was left behind? Zedekiah. Babylon's king, um, Nebuchadnezzar, came in and said, I'm going to put Zedekiah over this. And Zedekiah, I don't know if he was out of fear going, okay, I'll do whatever you want. Or if he's like, typically you choose people that are siding with you, right? So he picked Zedekiah. Zedekiah stayed. He ruled the nation of Israel. He submitted, or the nation of Judah, he submitted to Nebuchadnezzar rather than submitting to God. Rather than saying, I'm going to listen to God and I'm going to go out and surrender because they'll kill me. God says, no, I will preserve your life. He submitted to Nebuchadnezzar. I will serve you, Nebuchadnezzar. Just don't destroy us. Let us kind of hang out here. We'll pay you tribute. We'll, let us do our thing. He feared Nebuchadnezzar more than he feared God. Daniel reveal, revealed to us the folly in this. Nebuchadnezzar later in his life experiences the power of God. So you submitted to this man. Look at what happened to him. At the end of 12 months... He was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. This is Nebuchadnezzar. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. You see, Nebuchadnezzar fell to God's power. Now he was later, I think, restored back and some things happened, but Zedekiah trusted Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and others ex experienced the foolishness of denying God's existence, of denying God's power, of denying God's authority. The question is, will we go that? I don't believe that story is real. I don't believe that really happened. I think somebody just wrote that to scare us into to following some deity. Will we believe the gospel and the word of God is foolishness because we are perishing like dead, disgusting figs that we truly are before a holy, righteous, and perfect God? Or will we learn from their mistakes and not repeat their folly? Because brothers and sisters, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Submit to your enemy. He is gracious and kind, and you will be saved through it. Let's pray. Father.
You have promised us to save us, and we have come. We're gathered here today because we have heeded that. So today, for most of us, you have just reminded us of that. We're thankful. But God, if there are those within the the sound of my voice or someone who watches this throughout the week that is not submitted to Christ or is not, not sure, just unsure, I pray that you would come to them. Encourage them to talk to someone, talk to one of our elders, to me or to a friend that knows the gospel, to find assurance or to find Christ for the first time. Because it is a life-changing decision. It is life and death. And I pray that those that are close to this congregation would not persist in unbelief, but that they would come to the truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.